Good to go. <coughs> okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Hope you're getting ready for a good holiday. I'm going to get, continue on with uh, the pest management here. And we're going to go back to where we left off talking about plant disease. All right. So, what is a disease anyway? Um, actually, kind of a vague definition here. Um, we look at it just as any abnormal plant growth. And um, some plant scientists look at this as being caused directly by a pathogen, but uh, many also look at uh, those that are caused by non-living issues as well. So we can have injury from a you know, wide variety of issues that um, could be living or non-living. And it's very important to distinguish between the two. Um, so a disease causes this suboptimal plant growth. And we look at the abiotic, the non-living, as well as the biotic causes. So the abiotic issues can often actually look similar to um, a living issue. So um, for example, we can look at air pollutants whether that is uh, ozone, for instance, or uh, too much carbon dioxide even, or um, also just pesticide drift. We also look at nutritional deficiencies and toxicities, too little or too much of any of the essential nutrients that can cause an imbalance and uh, appear almost to look like a disease issue as well. Anything also that is just not the optimal conditions for the plant's growth. So we have too little light or too much light, too little moisture, too much moisture, too high or too low of a temperature. These all cause suboptimal plant growth and um, can often exacerbate the living uh, issues. You also th look at things like lightning strikes, hail damage, frost, uh, chemical burn, mechanical damage. Although these might not be you know, causal effects of the disease itself, they often lead to um, infection of a disease. So on the biotic disease, you know, the the living parts, we look at them being caused by pathogens. And pathogens are just really anything that can cause the entry of a organism that causes a disease and abnormal growth, suboptimal growth of the plant. And if we look at the infectious diseases, those that can move within and throughout plants. We're talking about the pathogens themselves. There's actually a wide variety of organisms that can cause diseases. And it's very important to distinguish between what it is it is causing. And re really where this comes into play is first just the you know environment. We were talking about you know the the disease triangle last week or just the factors that contribute to it the infection of the disease. One of them is just the presence of a pathogen itself. So we can look at these as being viruses, which um, viruses are non-living. Um, they are just like a packet of protein or DNA. We also look at bacteria, different types of plasmas, fungal-like organisms as well as fungi, nematodes, and also parasitic plants causing diseases. And these infect all kinds of different parts of the plant and uh, can cause many issues, ranging from rots in the roots or the fruits to rust, cankers, blights, and wilts. And these terms here are often assigned to an organism. Um, for instance, blight is often caused by a you know, fungal pathogen. 
but it depends on what plant it is that it is actually infecting. And these are more general terms, so they're not always specifically looking at just one organism. Blights, for instance, can be caused by fungi or by bacteria. Um, one of the things I think is important to examine when we're talking about plant diseases, or really any disease, is that um, one, many of these problems are fairly well documented. There are new you know, problems that are, that are coming up all the time, but many of them have been dealt with for a long time. And so there's a lot of information out there about them. Um, another issue is that if we look at just the optimal growth of the plants, if we have the optimal conditions, most plants kind of have, you know, an immune system like we do and are able to actually, you know, fight off many pathogens. So we look at some as uh, being very specific and only infecting just a one or a handful of species, whereas others can infect a broad range of plant species. And we look at the different stages of how these pathogens come in contact and then actually affect a plant. So first, just the uh, pathogen coming in contact with a host, we have to look at the host's susceptibility. So first we have to have a susceptible host. And if we do and it comes in contact, then we have inoculation. And uh, if anybody's interested in growing like mushrooms, for instance, um, we look at this, you know, as I think as a good analogy, we intentionally inoculate um, media with the fungal pathogen um, in order to, to get it to grow and to produce. There's also going to be a time in between when that pathogen actually comes in contact with it and enters and penetrates the host um, and the time that actually you start to see visual symptoms. So uh, first, it has to enter the host through some sort of opening, whether that's a natural opening and like the pores on the undersides of the leaves or in the bark or through a wound of the plant, uh, whether that is naturally caused or mechanically caused. Um, but then between the time that it has entered the host and actually establishes itself within the host, call that incubation. That period of time where, in the case of the fungi, um, let's just say that we have uh, decided to grow some shiitake mushrooms, for instance. We're going to take a log, you know, some wood, and we're going to, you know, open, make an opening, often drill holes in the log, inoculate it by putting the uh, fungal spores or spawn into those openings. And then the time between which it's entered and then when it, that mycelium, the kind of the fungal version of the roots, starts to run within the logs, refer to that as the incubation period. And then when it actually starts to display the physical symptoms, it begins to grow and actually reproduce, we look at that as infection. So, um, the shiitake mushrooms, the mycelium has run, and then they start to fruit. You see the actual physical body of that that is then going to sporulate and make more of it. So it's growing and reproducing. That's the infection part. So these stages are important um, just to be able to diagnose what the disease is, but also to be able to find out what is the susceptible you know, part to actually target in order to control the disease. We also look at the ability for that infection to spread within the plant or to other susceptible plants. And we refer to that as dissemination, the movement of spores. Of course, they also have to have you know, some, the, the correct environment for them to be able to go through these three stages. So here's just an image of looking at kind of this cycle. 
you know, it starts with the inoculation, the presence of it. It penetrates the plant, it establishes, and this is our um, period of incubation. Then it begins to grow and reproduce. And then it either spreads or doesn't spread, depending on whether there are more susceptible hosts there. So the primary thing that we look at for um, controlling diseases is really just preventing them. Again, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, in some cases maybe worth a lot more than a pound of cure. So we also need to distinguish between the term sign, which is um, basically the actual presence of the pathogen that we can observe, um, whether that is the actual fungal hyphae of the mycelium, presence of spores or the fruiting bodies of fungi, um, bacterial streaming or the cells that are present, um, versus symptoms, which are basically the plant's reaction to the presence of the organism. And the symptoms we look at as changing as the disease progresses. So some of the signs and symptoms that we look at might include abnormal tissue coloration. So leaves or stems, whatever part of the plant it is, looks different than it's supposed to. And, and another important thing here is, is to know exactly what that plant is supposed to look like down to the variety level. You know, if you say you're growing a new variety of tomato that has pleated fruit, you know, that's a natural characteristic. Although if you weren't aware of that, you might think that it's an abnormal growth. So we look at leaves becoming chlorotic or yellowish or, and really we talked about this um, as well as the purpling, bronzing, and the reddening when we were talking about the nutritional issues with plants. Deficiencies often accompany some sort of tissue coloration. We also see brown or necrotic growth where it's starting to die and that's often more caused by diseases. And really these things are important. I mean, they can occur either in abiotic or biotic conditions, but it's important to you know, test the soil or the media to make sure that the nutrients are there. Um, nitrogen deficient plants, as we mentioned, often start off by being chlorotic, start to turn yellow. If I see a plant starting to turn yellow, my first go-to is, does it have enough nitrogen? We can test that. Whether that Chlorosis is in between the veins or in the veins. If it's in between the veins, then that's often a deficiency. Iron deficiency, for instance, you get that intervenal chlorosis. Um, the picture here looking at these corn plants, um, they start to look purple, and that's often a sign of phosphorus deficiency. So, abiotic issues. We could get wilting, um, and really, what wilting you know, could be a cause of too much or not enough water, but it can also be caused by pathogens that are preventing um, or interfering with the water's uptake and movement through the plant. Um, so we look at several fungi, such as verticillium and fusarium, that cause wilt, as well as some bacteria. Um, as they are colonizing that xylem of the plants, preventing water transport. We also just look at the death of tissue, such as necrotic lesions appearing at any tissue um, on the plant. But often we, we look at the leaves mostly for these issues. And it can appear like as a decay of soft succulent tissue, um, or it could even also cause cankers, you have sunken or sometimes swollen tissues, and uh, often in woody plants. We also look at defoliation. So as the disease is progressing, the plant can lose all of its leaves, can abort its fruit. Um, so looking here at uh, apple scab here on the left in a crab apple, it starts to appear as these little lesions and then eventually it causes the um, leaves just to completely drop off. And here's just a close up image looking at that actual fungus 
emerging. You can also get abnormal growth, whether that's stunting or overgrowth, under or overgrowth. Um, kind of like a cancerous growth in a way. Um, some diseases are going to increase cell numbers or the cell size in plant tissues, causing the symptom of twisting and curling of leaves or the formation of galls on stems or roots, uh, like we see here. Um, you get dwarfing is from re reduction of that cell number or size and stunting parts or the whole plant. You can also get replacement of the plant's tissues by the tissue of the infectious organism. And here's a, a good example of that in a corn smut here on the right. And um, this is kind of an interesting case because uh, corn smut here is, this is just the fruiting body of the fungi. So that's like the mushroom there. And actually, um, while corn smut is destroying the ear of corn and is you know, very infectious. Um, it's actually a delicacy in Mexico. So people eat this. So it's, it's not all diseases are necessarily wholly bad if we kind of think of other ways to use them. Viruses are intracellular pathogenic particles that are infecting other living organisms. And the classic case of that um, comes with from the first virus that was ever described. And uh, that was tobacco mosaic virus that basically causes this abnormal like modeling in the leaves of plants that are in that same family as tobacco, like uh, tomatoes and peppers, eggplant, potatoes. Um, the issue with viruses is that they are, you know, they're not living for one, so there's not any pesticide out there that can control them. Um, we have to try to prevent them. You can't see virus particles. Um, they're microscopic and not even just a compound microscope. You have to use an electron microscope to be able to see them because they're on that cellular level. Um, Viruses, though, they do require that there, you know, be some sort of wounding for um, entrance into the plant. We also look at the organisms that can transmit the pathogens, and um, very important in the case of tobacco mosaic virus, as well as many other viruses, we call these organisms vectors, and usually they are like insects, for instance, and through feeding on the plant, they're actually introducing that pathogen into the wound. Viruses are obligate parasites, so they actually require the living host to be able to grow and multiply. So one way to prevent the spread of viruses is to remove that host and potentially other um, host organisms. Viruses are very difficult to classify and you know, they, they change all the time um, because they're not living. We don't think of it really as evolution per se, but or adaptation, but basically just an alteration of the DNA or the proteins that are in these little um, cellular packets. If you have an infection of a virus, there's not really anything that you can do. So we look at prevention such as planting resistant cultivars or just practicing very good sanitation, keeping it clean. Bacteria um, are also microscopic, um, but though they are single-celled organisms, they often, when they're actually becoming infectious and you know, causing a plant disease, occurring in large colonies of cells. Um, and they occur in between cells. And uh, th there's only two classes of bacteria that are actually known to cause diseases in plants. And um, those are bacilli and actinomyces. One of the issues with bacteria is that they multiply at alarming rates as long as they have the suitable environmental conditions. And we generally think of that as being warm and moist. Unfortunately, the kind of environment that our plants optimal growth prefer to.
we also look at fungi and fungal like organisms or flows and they actually are the cause of more plant diseases than any other group of plant pathogenic organisms. There are over 8,000 species of fungi and fungal like organisms that are shown to cause diseases in plants. And we can look at these um, such as organisms like Pythium and Phytophthora. These cause um, downy mildew and other forms of like damping off and other forms of rot. And these are fungal like organisms and they're kind of like in a class in between bacteria and fungi called the oomycetes. Um, generally though, they are heterotrophic organisms. They can't photosynthesize on their own. So they have to colonize and basically absorb nutrients through these like root like structures known as the hyphae or collectively known as mycelium or mycelium. And the same deal with the uh, fungi as with most diseases is that some of them can only infect one host species where others can de develop on many different kinds. Um, so here's an image that I'm sure everybody has seen. Um, this is, can be a um, post-harvest issue as well as a pre-harvest issue, but we have botrytis here, which uh, we often refer to as gray molds. And um, it's forming here on the fruit of a strawberry, often colonizes on soft fruit that is kind of past its prime. You don't usually see it on um, underripe or just ripe fruit. You, you start to see it on overripe fruit. Um, so if you look at it closely, we actually see the sign of it here in the actual like filament-like mycelia and then the fruiting bodies that cause the sporulation and then the spread of botrytis. We also look at nematodes, which um, are actually technically animals. You know, they're, they are in the animal kingdom. They're not bacteria or fungi, but they're very simple and they're microscopic, which is why we often lump them in with diseases. Um, they're not super complex organisms, but they do, you know, they are eukaryotic, they do carry many cells. They do kind of look like worms, especially if you're looking at them under a microscope. They're very worm-like, but they're very different than what we think of as like earthworms, for instance. They're soft-bodied and non-segmented round worms. And can kind of think of a nematode as like a tube within a tube. And nematodes, there's you know, many different species of them out there and most of them are not harmful. You know, many of them are actually just feeding in on organic matter, breaking it down in the soil. But then some of them are um, predators actually you know, eating fungi or eating um, bacteria in some, some cases, insects as well. They're like more parasites. But of course, some of them are also plant parasites. And we often look at the mouth parts of the nematodes as being able to differentiate between them. And if it has this stylet, like a bundle of like needle-like structures at its head, then it is a, a plant pathogen and can cause other issues. And nematodes are, you know, we think of them often as being underground, but they can also be above ground too. But because they're microscopic, we cannot see them and they are somewhat difficult to diagnose. Um, so usually for nematodes, we're not looking necessarily as at the signs, the actual physical presence of the organism, but we're usually more looking at the symptoms, how the plant reacts to that growth. So one of the ways that that happens is through uh, root knot. So we see here in uh, this image a plant that has been infected by nematodes and it causes this kind of gnarly and knot like uh, symptom as a result of that nematodes infection of the plant. And they have a great range of hosts and can be very highly damaging. So we're trying to diagnose a plant disorder, first we have to try to 
observe and define the problem. So what is the problem that is, is actually existing there? And uh, first that starts with knowing what your host is. What is the plant that it is happening to? Down to the species and the cultivar level. What is its normal appearance and how does the appearance that we're trying to diagnose differ from that normal appearance. And we want to look at all the factors. You know, what, you know, what are the, our cultural practices, for instance? Has it, you know, have we got the proper optimal conditions, the proper environment for it to grow? Well, again, you know, a, a healthy plant can resist most disease problems. We also want to look at the entire plant community, whether that is, you know, in nature in a natural ecosystem or in our agro ecosystems in our cropping, uh, looking at um, in the row as well as throughout the rows in the whole field and looking at those environmental conditions along with that. So being very observative here and um, taking notes, keeping records, looking at the entire plant as well as many plants. And we got to play detective here and take kind of like a journalistic approach. We're looking for patterns. Is there just one plant affected or are there many plants affected? Is it restricted just to one plant species or a certain area or is it multiple species? If it's just a single plant that is affected and it kind of appears randomly, it's often more a living issue rather than a non-living issue. Whereas if it's the whole field that's affected, then it's probably a non-living issue. Um, too much water, too much light. Is it restricted to a certain area or a single species? If it is, then you know, that can kind of go either way but looking again at the specificity, is it a particular organism that's only attacking a particular plant? Are the symptoms random or are there distinct patterns between healthy and affected plants? Looking at the topography in the field, is there like a swell or a sink somewhere where there's less drainage in the soil? Um, that could you know, be an abiotic issue that leads to a biotic issue. Also looking at how the damage has developed over time. Did it just appear suddenly or did, was it gradually appearing and spreading? If it appears suddenly, it's often more due to an abiotic cause. Um, if it's gradually spreading, then it's usually more due to a living issue. Has it spread or just stayed in the same location? If it stays, then it's usually not living. If it's spreading, then it's living. So looking at that progressive development and that spread over time can indicate the damage that is caused by both pathogens and insects. So asking questions, gathering information, taking notes on this and determining the causes of the plant damage will help us to, to lead to good plant diagnosis and the steps to take. So looking at the cultivar variety and its age, its stage of, of development and growth. Our cultural practices, have we applied fertilizer or pesticides? Chemical burn can look like a disease issue. Um, we often will get people thinking that they have blight um, due to just cooler weather. Um, frost looks a lot like blight. Um, has it been underwatered or overwatered? What's the history of that site or the stand? How has that damage progress? Looking for the physical signs of the pathogen or insects and pests. And if you can't figure it out on your own, I mean, there's lots of resources out there on the web, um, in literature, but you can also use your extension agents. You know, at every county we have these extension agents and they're generally fairly familiar with the disease problems that affect crops in their areas. So um, talking to the experts and if you need to, you know, sending plant samples off 
for diagnosis to a lab or a clinic, um, whether that's a state university or um, a third party, you know, kind of private entity. Try to take pictures too, looking at, you know, how these, you know, issues are progressing. Those can aid your own diagnosis as well as those of others as well. All right, so does anybody have any questions there on pests and pest management? No, we'll go ahead and we'll just start off here on looking at a production here just for our last few minutes of class. Um, so chapter 16, we're getting into the general considerations for production, harvest, and post-harvest handling, as well as marketing. So um, most of the, you know, kind of general principles and practices for our crops are fairly similar. You know, we want to look at that, again, that optimal condition of the plants. What do they need in terms of temperature and light and moisture? and nutrients. And because there's this group of essential nutrients and um, groups of plants, you know, our warm season crops all require the same kind of temperatures, right? So they can be similar, but they can also be very different. So before you ever grow a crop, it's very important to analyze the site where you're going to actually be producing that crop. Ideally, we want arable land. We want it to be easily workable, good soil, well-drained soil that has lots of organic matter in it. Once we kind of analyze the site, you know, ideally a place that has you know, full sun for most of our crops, um, not in a frost pocket, although there are some cases where you might want to have a frost pocket. Um, then starting to choose a growing system, you know, how are you going to produce that crop. It's very important to kind of plan that out. Um, then looking at how you're going to harvest and preserve the crop that you have harvested. Next comes our marketing systems and our transport to get it to market. So in the sites analysis, um, we want to look, you know, we, I think it's important to start small, um, start with what you know that you can sell. Um, but think about the future as well. Always keep in mind your ability to expand. Um, as well as, you know, other uses of a potential area. You know, we've kind of um, been doing some agritourism in some of the labs there. You know, say that agritourism in Virginia is actually now the fastest growing sector of agriculture and by adding that in there it, it might not be you know your mainstay but it might give you, you know, some extra income in the off season so that that's just another issue another use i should say that, that should be considered whenever you're looking at um, producing a crop you also want to look at you know who can you market to so um, and how far are you from that market so who is your customer? Where are they? How do you get the crop to them? And, you know, how, in some cases, how do you get them to the crop? Thinking very generally about, you know, our site analysis, we have to have good water available, of course, um, throughout the growing season. And we can look at that in terms of natural precipitation or potentially a um, surface water source, such as you know a, a body of water, a lake, a pond, a stream that we might be able to pump that water from, maybe a well, um, as well as the municipal sources. And I, I'll just say, um, kind of coming from you know both perspectives here, when I was you know, producing crops for a living. Um, we kind of rely on a little bit of everything. You know, we, we look at the natural precipitation, but whenever we can't, you know, we don't have enough natural precipitation because generally in the, our mid-Atlantic region here, it's somewhat sporadic. 
you know, we don't have like a dry season and a wet season, like, you know, many agricultural areas do have. So yeah, if you have dry spells, you need to have the ability to get water to it. So um, we had natural rainfall and we look at that in terms of a gauge. You're not, you're not just looking at um, the weather report, you know, how much rain has fallen over a general area you're looking at it in that actual microclimate in the site. So it's important to actually gauge the rainfall as well. I think it's important to actually have like a little weather station on the farm um, and kind of look at that throughout time because, you know, as we know, it, you know, it comes and goes, right? So um, we had a kind of a surface slash subsurface source as well in that we had a spring nearby. Um, issue with the spring though, and we're, we you know, put a pump in our spring and started to pump water to our crops. But if you're exceeding the rate of recharge in that spring, then guess what? Then you can, you can dry it out. And we, we actually had that issue happen several times. Um, so then what do you have? You know, what's the next step? In some cases, we look at the municipal sources. So, you know, we were using county water when we had to if the spring was dry. Um, issue with that, different water quality in each of these situations. Quantity and the quality is important. And generally, municipal sources, um, while they have decent water quality in terms of it's often free of pathogens because it's been sterilized, it also has chlorine and, and fluoride in it that is often uh, detrimental to most of your crops. Those are, you know, they accumulate in soils in salt form and can lead to salinization of soil. Which the other issue is that it just costs money, right? So um, if you're looking at using irrigation, which um, can be expensive, but can, you know, be crucial in some cases, what is the that type of irrigation system, what is its cost of insulation and maintenance, and just know that you have to monitor it. If you're using drip irrigation, for instance, you have to go through there and make sure that the emitters don't get clogged. Looking at the physical features, the lay of the land, the topography is important. Ideally, we want like, you know, relatively flat or level land, although sloping land can be used as well. Um, and you know, can make different microclimates that can be important um, to, to grow particular crops. We think of for our commodities, generally they're grown in areas where it's very flat and it's easy to mechanically harvest them. Um, we might grow, if on steeper areas, we might grow things like more like perennial crops. Um, we grow tree crops, orchards in places where we don't have flat lands. Um, we have steep areas, we might not be able to produce any plant crop, but we might look at um, growing forage for grazing. Um, also looking at the runoff of water. Is there, are there areas subject to flooding? Um, is there water that you can store in site? Again, look at the microclimates, and often that is linked to the topography. So one of the general things on the microclimate, we just look at the aspects. So whether it's on the north, south, east, or west side of a slope, for instance. Um, on the north side, it's going to be receiving the least amount of sun throughout the season, at least in the northern hemisphere anyway. So it's usually going to retain moisture the longest. I'm sure you've heard that adage that um, you know, moss grows on the north side of the tree. Well, it doesn't always. It just depends on um, moisture. But um, often that moisture is stored longest on the north side. So we look at the warm and cold zones form through that. The sun rises in the east, so it's not warming up quite as quickly. Um, the south side gets the most exposure throughout the day, so it tends to be the warmest. The west side gets late afternoon sun, so it's often warmer and uh, stays warmer longer than the east side. So um, microclimate is affected by the topography, but also by changes in elevation 
as well as any other geographic or architectural features, walls, buildings, affecting the movement of wind, movement of moisture. Soil type is extremely important because it determines one, you know, just its ability to hold water, um, but also the ability to hold nutrients. We can alter the soil to become more productive. And the best way to do that, of course, is through additions of organic matter long term. But you know, we can only amend the soil to a certain extent. Um, it's important to look at that soil type when you come into growing your crops. Um, if you, you know, let's just say, for example, you want to grow rice, you got to have a, you know, a water holding soil to be able to do that. Um, most of our crops, though, tend to prefer a well drained soil. So um, growing in subsoil or, you know, straight clay is a very difficult, very difficult to grow crops, keep them alive. Looking at, again, the, the whole climate issue, whether that's microclimate or the macroclimate, um, in some cases, we might need to protect crops from the sun and from heat, um, especially in warmer regions or those that are very highly exposed, um, or protect them from cold in certain situations. We want to look at the annual patterns of precipitation. Um, many of the places where we practice agriculture kind of have um, some sort of seasonality to that, um, whether it's a dry spill followed by a wet spill. Um, also looking at the prevailing wind direction and the potential for you know, storms related to that. Where is that wind coming from? Does that change? throughout the seasons? How does that influence our crop growing practices? Do we need to put in a windbreak, for instance, to prevent the wind from damaging crops? Always looking at the possibility of extremes, which of course is hard to predict, but I mean, just looking at the, uh, the weather records for a place, um, especially looking at the temperature, you know, what are the lowest lows? What are the highest highs? Um, what are you likely to have to contend with in growing your crop? And what is your crop able to contend with? The biggest initial expense in any kind of agricultural production is just the cost of land itself. Um, and we have the issue that, you know, many of us may be being you know, beginning farmers, you know, that access to land. However, um, I will note that um, due to the rising age of farmers in Virginia, as well as nationwide, um, that average age it basically lends to the fact that there's going to be more land changing hands in the coming generation than perhaps ever before in American history. So it's, it's kind of up to us to figure out how that land is going to be used. There are a lot of organizations out there that are looking at this. And uh, I mean, many people that want to keep land in agriculture production. So in some cases, they may be willing to, you know, lease to, to own, for instance, or maybe even in some cases, just give land to people who are willing to work it. So um, while land costs can be prohibitive to um, many producers, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, doesn't have to end there. There's some ways around that. We also look at the availability of labor as a major issue as well. Um, again, starting small, I think, is important. You know, keeping it to where you can do it with as minimal labor resources as possible. Um, if land is the largest and, you know, the, the in initial expense, then um, labor generally is the second largest, um, kind of the biggest operating expense. Um, what, are you, what do you want to pay yourself, right? That's something important to look at 
Um, are you willing to, you know, sacrifice a second home, say, for the lifestyle of living and working the land? Um, so generally, we say that labor accounts or can account for a third of business costs. And we look at that labor being somewhat seasonal. Um, generally, in times of harvest, it becomes very important. So um, many agricultural areas look at migrant labor in order to be able to you know, afford that harvest. Um, also, um, on the, the labor front, you know, having a trained labor pool, knowing that people are actually know what they're doing when they come to work for you as well. Um, another issue, and of course, the, the economic front and the social factors associated with that is just that um, if we're looking at perennial crops, you might have to grow them for several years before they generate a return on your investment. So how do you operate you know, your, your production during the time, you know, when you're waiting for there to be a harvestable crop. Also have to look at transportation and, um, you know, whether you're like a retail situation or a wholesale situation. Are you looking at the retail side, you know, are you selling directly to your customer? Are you having maybe your customer come to you? Or are you going to meet your customer somewhere? Somehow you're going to have to transport your harvestable portion, that crop, to that spot. Um, one of the ways that uh, some growers are at least somewhat alleviating that is uh, through the you pick situation. So kind of blending that agritourism in there, having people come to you to pick up um, your you know actual crop there. So looking at the equipment for transportation, how you're gonna move it, also how you're going to um, get it to the place where it's marketed, whether that's depending on you know, what you have and how perishable your crop is. Um, also looking at you know, the labor pool, you have to be able to allow that labor pool access to um, wherever it is you are producing the crop. Generally, the retail businesses, we look at that as being an on-site operation. And for that, we're looking at spaces for the actual direct sales or um, you know, parking for your customers. So thinking about the retail and the wholesale situation, very important as well. Ideally, all this site analysis um, is going into a production plan before we ever begin producing the crop. So we know what it looks like, we know what the pathways are um, before we get into production and we, we end up with a situation of, I've got this crop, you know, I'm good at producing it, but now what do I do with it? And on that note, I believe we are out of time, so I'll turn it back to you guys if you have any questions or concerns. All right, well, um, you all have a happy Thanksgiving. Enjoy the holiday. And uh, we'll see you next week. Okay. I've already had two Thanksgiving dinners already, so it's been fantastic.